Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter but not the spirit of a request. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel and for so many likes. The first story, company is hit with original crypto locker. CFO forced me to turn the servers back on before I had found the infected machine and reinfected the entire network. The second story, I call our landlord knowing my neighbor isn't paying pet rent and she gets evicted. I keep her cat. The third story, assistant director lost valuable employees because of his stupidity. On to the first story. Turn it back on? Okay. This happened about five years ago when ransomware was just came into inception and had not yet hit mainstream coverage, e.g. Crypto Locker 1.0. So there was barely any information or processes for recovery. At the time, I was working for a boutique managed service provider, MSP, and had the opportunity to onboard a new customer who had just signed a managed agreement with us. They had come from having an internal sysadmin, let's call him Jeff, who was a 6'3 chubby R, who smelt like he showered once a week and was dubbed the dirty R there onwards. Jeff was not achieving business goals and the business wasn't getting the TLC they deserved. During handover, I was tasked with performing an initial audit and gathering information from Jeff to ensure a smooth transition. Every question Jeff answered was, I don't know, you'll figure it out, or talk to this third-party person. After getting credentials to the server, I concluded that's all that was required and locked out his access until his two weeks' notice were finished. To put shortly, the entire environment was a mess. They had two businesses in one premises parent company's side business, running from a single ADSL2 connection with no redundancy, backups or network separation. Skip forward a few months of hard work and implementation of best practices. Backups, monitoring, security, multi-internet WAN, failover, etc. They were starting to look healthier minus the businesses being on the same subnet slash firewall as they needed access to files for each of the businesses. It's around this time I've learned that the business is IT illiterate and simple problems were a huge deal. If I was to give an example, it would be as bad as teaching my grandma that her mouse won't work when it's unplugged, but add in anger and threats and calls from their CFO threatening to drop the managed contract. Now the CFO for the group was an elderly 60 to 70s old school P who always woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Let's call him Shane. Shane would refuse to pay for antivirus because free AVG is the best as well as other necessary upgrades and wouldn't allow any downtime, even out of hours for maintenance. 9 to 8 p.m. business, mind you. All right, context over. Let's get to the MC part of the story. It was a Tuesday, roughly 2 p.m., right after I'm getting back from my lunch break at the gym. I receive a call from one of the accountants telling me that she can't open any of her Excel files. I went through the normal process of figuring out what's happened and determining it's an eight layer slash PEBCAC problem, etc. Now, I had been reading an article earlier in the day about this virus, or form of data manipulation program, that was renaming files to underscore encrypted and encrypting its data. There was a payment gateway asking for $600 to unencrypt data, in broken English, and that's about it. I asked the accountant what's the file name of one of the documents she can't open. She says something along the lines of company name underscore team underscore budget name underscore year underscore version underscore encrypted, and my heart sinks immediately. Why are you naming files like that, you crazy lady? There's a limit of characters. Also, I log on to the server and immediately search for asterisk dot underscore encrypted wildcard on their three file servers. I find that two servers are almost completely encrypted and I can see a few folders on the third that are cooked. There was no way to tell where it started. All user profiles were encrypted. I let the accountant know I need to turn off the file servers now as they've been hit with a virus that's eating all their files. She panics as the CFO is away until the next day, and the owner is overseas as of the prior Saturday for leave and light work. We discussed, assessed the risks, and agreed to shut the file servers down until we can figure out what happened. Turns out the spread now went to both businesses, and it was a huge mess. If only they invested in separation of infrastructure. I had raised the situation with my technical leader and continued working through the issue myself while everyone started to frantically question the almighty Google. I start scanning all computers trying to find the entry point, using every tool available at the time. Nothing was coming up. Antivirus had no chance of detecting it. I'm emailing the customer updates throughout this time. It's now 3 a.m. and I cannot find the infected PC or server at all, SHing bricks about what I was going to do in four hours. 
I emailed the client's upper management again with an update on the status and head to bed. I couldn't sleep, got up at 6 and headed straight to site to see if there's any missed devices that might be causing the problem. I walk in, start checking computers that are never touched, and then I hear this growl. It's Shane walking in the front door with a scrunched up face, looking at me dead in the eyes as if I slept with his wife. Shane stomps up to me in front of all the staff on floor, 20 to 25 staff, yells at me, why the F of my staff not been working since yesterday, who do you think you are? I of course ask if he had a chance to read my emails. This doesn't float well and I get yelled at more. I try to explain it in the most simplest way possible so he will understand. If the servers come back online and the ransomware is still running, the files that aren't encrypted and the restored data could get encrypted again and you'll be waiting even longer. His face gets even more red. I don't give a flying FOP, turn the servers on now, you're costing the business XYZ. I try to explain again that it will be a disaster. He's not having it and continues to yell at me in front of all of his staff, then storms off to his office yelling on his way to turn it all back on. I've been berated in front of all the staff and I'm just over it, dead tired. I simply shout out, okay, turning it on. I sit down, take a big swig of my coffee, log in and turn it all back on around 8am. Everyone is connected and happy to be working again. I message my boss what just went down and he's in amazement, lets me know I can leave sight if it's too much. I stay around to continue looking for the missed devices causing this hell. About an hour passes, people start complaining they can access their data again. I log in, do a double over, oh dear, what's this? Everything, literally every server is encrypted now. 20 servers. I pack up my laptop, grab my coffee and I walk out of the office with the biggest smirk on my face and head home to go for a long, long sleep. Five days later, 20 servers are restored from off-site backups, CFO has submitted his resignation after a long meeting with the CEO, and the owner owns up to opening an OUSPOST email attachment while on the VPN in Hawaii, while logged in as a domain admin account that the Dirty R gave to the owner before he left. My bad. And we dropped the client two weeks later. The next story is… Animal Abusing H Gets Drop Kicked From The Neighborhood one year ago, I was renting a house next to the most unpleasant neighbor I hoped to ever experience. The only thing I liked about her was her cat, this freakishly adorable tabby who could grab even the most hardened criminal's heart by the balls. Every time I came home from work, he would sidle up next to me for some TLC, which he never got from my neighbor. As far as I could tell, she just used the poor thing to keep away mice and play, i.e. be terrorized by her toddler grandkids on the weekends. The poor fur baby looked severely underfed and always appreciated the meals I'd leave out for him on our back porch. I have an indoor fur baby of my own, a tailless ball of energy, aptly named Goblin, and one day he managed to escape outside. Luckily I found him within a few hours, but by the next morning what jumps on my lap? Not Goblin alas, but a flea, and if my social butterfly cat had fleas, I was positive the next door fur baby had fleas too. Now, I already had a bitter history with this neighbor. In addition to being a tea rocket to her cat, she'd harassed my older parents when they were helping me move in. Why? Because our U-Haul rental was blocking a dead-end sidewalk in front of my house. My parents are very kind people. My mom has literally been thanked on customer service hotlines for being so sweet. And this lady was berating them needlessly for ruining the community, ranting even longer than they'd been parked, until they eventually moved to an inconvenient and wholly unnecessary distance. Regardless of her tea rocket personality, I figured I'd warn her anyway in the best interests of her fur baby. When I knew she was at home the next day, I knocked on her front door. When she answered, no hello, just a scowl, I started to explain that my escaped indoor cat has fleas and so there was a good possibility that her outdoor cat also had fleas. Immediately she berates me for letting my cat get fleas and snaps that she keeps her house very clean, unlike me, so there's no way her cat has fleas. I just loudly sighed at her and went back home as she continued to yell. You've never been in my house, lady, and that's not how fleas work. All week I noticed her cat scratching himself raw and felt so bad for the little guy. I wanted to give him flea medication and a flea bath, but with my neighbor now watching me like a hawk and screeching like a banshee if I even pet him anymore, I had to leave him alone. But I realized there was something I could do. You see, we shared the same landlord, who was very concerned about household pests and instructed us to call him at the first sight of a bedbug, tick, etc. I also knew that my neighbor was keeping her cat a secret from the landlord to avoid paying the pet rent, as I'd overheard her bragging about this to a friend outside one day. So what do I do? I call up the landlord to explain the flea situation, and I make sure to add that my neighbor's cat has also been scratching like crazy. There's a pause. Did you say she has a cat? 
Yes, I assure him, she definitely has an indoor-outdoor cat. Turns out that my neighbor had harassed our landlord into replacing most of her carpet due to her alleged cat allergy. I don't know why the landlord caved into this, but it wasn't cheap. And now our landlord learned that not only had Mad Woman lied about an allergy to score a free renovation, but she hadn't paid pet rent in more than a year. Well, an exterminator gets called, and our landlord himself shows up to oversee the whole thing. We had both received a flyer taped to our front doors, giving notice that he would be coming to our houses on that date but I may or may not have removed my neighbors, so she wouldn't be able to just hide evidence of her cat for a few hours. So our landlord arrives, and I listen gleefully with my window open, as my neighbor tries to prevent him and the exterminator from entering. Eventually, she allows them to come inside, where there's obvious evidence of a pet living there. I don't know exactly what transpired between her and the landlord. There must be other SH stains on her record, being such a nutcase, but a few months later I had a new next door neighbor. And guess who Madwoman purposely abandoned during the move? her poor fur baby, who became a much-loved and flea-free member of our house. The last story is, we're replaceable and you're happy to help us leave? Okay. I used to work for a small, fee-for-service nonprofit. The average number of clients served was slash is around 250. The average caseload is 12, but can range from 10 to 20 per person, and may exceed 20 depending on circumstance. Non-management staff hover around 18 to 20 people. New staff aren't really able to effectively use client-authorized hours until several months in, so the org is reliant on senior staff to keep projected income up. This is relevant later. Keeping it as understandable as possible, one of the perks of being a senior staff member was receiving a personalized, facilitated plan for your goals. Once the plans were done individually, everyone who received one from all regions of the org came together as a group to discuss. This was meant to be an opportunity to share, support each other, and figure out next steps. Since our plans were mostly done around our goals at the company, we had an honest conversation about what we need to be successful. It wasn't inappropriate in any way, and many of the needs we brought up were already being met. It was honestly just a facilitated discussion around how to keep focused on advancing our career there. Well, one person from another region with more weight didn't like how the day went, so they complained to their manager, who's also a personal friend. That manager worked herself up about it, created a new story, and went straight to the assistant director. The assistant director is a very reactionary person and isn't very well liked. Most just avoid or placate her. Everyone in my region at the group meeting gets an email from AD saying we all need to cancel all appointments and be in her office at a specified time the next day. Remember, we're senior staff. That means five of us canceled our client-based appointments to go into this mystery meeting, losing the company money. Meeting comes. We're sat down in front of all the managers in our region and the AD. She launches into us with the following highlights. How dare you use group time to provide feedback about the organization? She's so ashamed and doesn't trust us to represent the company, informs us that we wasted $7,000 of the company's money and that her toddlers behave better than us. She ends this five minute rant by saying that every one of us is replaceable and they'd be happy if we left. We five sit in stunned silence before the meeting is concluded and we all walk out. Turns out the AD never spoke to the facilitator didn't consult any other attendees from other regions, in fact, didn't bother getting any additional information at all. To add insult to injury, my boss, one of the managers in the room, told me the point of that meeting was to make us feel SH when I asked what follow-up was needed for me. I found a job within two weeks and left. Two other people in that meeting quit within a month. A fourth is halfway out the door. Others found out about the meeting, and so far, four additional staff have left. All seven of us who quit so far had been there for three years or more, and our departures were no more than two months apart. Our total caseloads numbered roughly 120 clients, meaning that almost half the organization's clients are without staff to support them, and there are now five new hires without mentors. One of the new hires quit because of this, making eight people gone in two months. This turnover has never happened before. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to see more stories like this.